Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for July 2nd, 2021. And on this episode, I'm talking about American independence, not specifically the Declaration or even the war, but a change in the views and the sentiments of the people of the colonies from being mere subjects to becoming citizens of independent sovereign nations. And we can trace the beginnings of that controversy all the way back to early 1761 and James Otis Jr. taking on the writs of assistance. So today I've got a quick introduction and overview of that, plus some highlights from his great speech. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show show homepage has everything you need to follow this program, all the archives. For about three years now, on individual episodes like today's, I'll include a bunch of links and references so you can read and learn more on your own time in context. You can find all the different platforms we're on. We're on a bunch of video ones and then audio-only podcast editions. And then we have our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. And we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and Liberty. That show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here. Whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one, thank you so much. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time Let's see if I can get this info out to you in the next 10 to 15 minutes ish. I want to first start out by pointing out that on July 3rd, 1776, John Adams wrote Abigail Adams, not just one, but two letters celebrating passage of the Lee Resolution, which is what uh, the follow up was the declaration a couple days later. And I covered that in an episode on June 7th of this year, totally dissolved the Lee Resolution and Independence, where you can get some background and the history behind that and the impact of that on independence. Now, John Adams thought that we'd be celebrating Independence Day every year in the years to come on July 2nd. He was off by a couple of days, but the Lee Resolution was incredibly important. I do encourage you to check out that episode if you haven't done so already. But anyways, at the end of his second letter... To Abigail, he made a point here. He says, when I look back to the year 1761 and recollect the argument concerning writs of assistance in the superior court, which I have hitherto considered as the commencement of the controversy between Great Britain and America and run through the whole period from that time to this and recollect the series of political events, the chain of causes and events. I am surprised at the suddenness as well as greatness of this revolution. And here from Wikipedia, they point out that this was all back to 1761. It was the 1761 of Paxton v. Gray. And there they say a group of outraged Boston businessmen, which included Ezekiel Goldthwaite, engaged James Otis Jr. to challenge the legality of writs of assistance before the Superior Court. These writs enabled the the authorities to enter any home with no advance notice, no probable cause, no reason given. Of course, no oath, no affirmation, none of that stuff that came out of it. James Otis Jr., of course, we can call him the founding father of the Fourth Amendment, even though he didn't live to see it ratified. Now, Otis considered himself, they say, a loyal subject to the crown, yet he argued against the writs of assistance in a nearly five hour oration before a select audience in the state house in February of 1761. Now, here are just a few of the of my favorite quotes from that speech. We're getting them from notes from John Adams, who was a young, uh, young man at the time, was there present and taking notes on the event. And here, right in the outset, Otis goes right to it. He says, I will to my dying day oppose with all the powers and faculties God has given me all such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other as this writ of assistance is. I mean, this is not pulling any punches right off the right out of the gates. He says, it appears to me the worst instrument of arbitrary power. Now, arbitrary power, if you heard me talk about this 
Many of the founders and old revolutionaries use this phrase. They saw as a government without limits, a power without restraint, as Samuel Adams put it, is a tyranny. An arbitrary is power is power that can be changed on a whim. And he says, it appears to me the worst instrument of arbitrary power, not just the bad, but the worst, the most destructive of English li liberty and the fundamental principles of law that was ever found in an English law book. And if he makes the point that there's a big difference between a general warrant, an unending warrant, and something that has a special purpose, a specific purpose, something specially named. He says, your honors will find in the old books concerning the office of a justice of peace, precedence of general warrants to search suspected houses. But in more modern books, you will find only special warrants to search such and such houses specially named in which the complainant has before sworn that he suspects his goods are concealed, and you will find it adjudged that special warrants only are legal. So any broad-based general warrant where they aren't naming exactly where they're going, what they're looking for, is something that they consider to be illegal. And James Otis certainly made the case about this. And he refers to this. He says the writ prayed for in this petition being general is illegal. It is a power that places the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer. Later on in the speech, he actually refers to them as petty tyrants. And then he says you create a petty tyranny. And he talked about this a little further in an essay a few months later that he wrote for the Boston Gazette in January of 1762. And he said specifically, can a community be safe with an uncontrolled power lodged in the hands of such officers, some of whom have given abundant proofs of the danger there is in trusting them with any? So he's saying uh, some of these have already shown us by their own behavior that they can't be trusted with any power at all. So a community can't be safe when government has uncontrolled, unlimited, arbitrary power. And then back to the speech again, February 24th, 1761. This is one that I think most of you will recognize. He says, now one of the most essential branches of English liberty is the freedom of one's house. A man's house is his castle. And whilst he is quiet, he is as well guarded as a prince in his castle. And he pointed out that one of the problems with a general warrant is that they don't have it. They're not specified. They're they're never ending. They're open ended. It's kind of like open ended so-called authorizations use military force today. But that's another episode. He says, again, these writs are not returned. Writs in their nature are temporary things. When the purposes for which they are issued are answered, they exist, exist no more. But these live forever and no one can be called to account. And he's talking about holding government officials accountable as well. And that's a precursor to many of the issues that we face today. And he sums it up near the end and he points out that no acts of parliament can establish such a rich writ. He's even saying that even though you've done this, you still can't do it. Even if parliament puts it into an act we can't have it. It doesn't matter what they've put on paper because why he says an act against the constitution is void. And while he was talking about the unwritten constitution, the principle holds true today An act against the rules that are meant for the government. If they try to do something, they're not authorized to do. It is void. And of course, from 1761 through many years later, 1783, maybe there were many, many actions that were taken to render these types of things null and void in practice. Now, back to John Adams. Here he is writing to William Tudor Senior Senior in March of 1817, again, describing this. He talked about this this moment in time as being so important a number of times throughout his life. And he says after James Otis's speech, he says, American independence was then and there born. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child independence was born. In 15 years, in 1776, he grew up to manhood and declared himself free. 
And one more time, here's a letter, John Adams, to Jedediah Morse a couple years earlier in November of 1815. He said, when the cause came on, however, Mr. Otis displayed so comprehensive a knowledge of the subject, showed not only the illegality of the writ, its insidious and mischievous tendency, but he laid open the views and designs of Great Britain of taxing us of destroying our charters and assuming as the powers of our government, legislative, executive, and judicial, external and internal, civil and ecclesia, ecclesiastical, temporal and spiritual. This is really, Adams is really, really laying it on here. He says, and all this was performed with such a profusion of learning, such convincing argument, and such a torrent of sublime and pathetic eloquence that a great crowd of spectators and auditors went away absolutely electrified. So he saw this moment, this great speech, which we really only have notes on from others, this great speech against the writs of assistance as laying the groundwork, the birth of independence, all the way back to 1761. He began, he says, here then, sir, began the revolution in the principles, views, opinions, and feelings of the American people. Their eyes were open to a clear sight of the danger that threatened them and their posterity and the liberties of both in all future generations. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope you're encouraged to read a little, little bit more and learn more about this, whether it's just to read through the full text of the speech, uh, the notes, uh, James Otis's uh, personal essay written in early 1762 or some of these letters that john adams wrote later on i hope you want to learn more i hope this was educational and i hope you have a great independence day weekend whatever you're doing whether you're spending time by yourself with family with friends you're working on a project doesn't matter i really really appreciate you spending some time with me today uh, if you want to support the show, you want to help us spread the word, there's a few free and easy peasy things that you can do to help us spread that word. Smash the like button, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform, uh, leaving comments, especially in the archive, sharing links, subscribing, getting notifications, all that stuff triggers mainstream platform algorithms and tells the program platform to show the program to more people. And of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind a work, as I mentioned at the outset, you can get our membership. Uh, you can sign up for our membership for as little as two bucks a month. We also have annual five-year lifetime memberships where you can get one of these pretty cool uh, 110% Tenther cards. That's all over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you spending some of your time with me today. I hope you have a great Independence Day weekend, and I'll see you next week here on the path to liberty.